Okay, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started today. So thank you so much for joining us um, on today's webinar. I'm Allison Foster, the president of the National Board of Public Health Examiners, which administers a certified in public health credential. So the CPH Book Club, which is hosting the webinar today, was formed three years ago, and we now have over a thousand members. We read and discuss about eight books a year on a broad range of topics from infectious disease to behavioral economics to policy and public health. And periodically, we invite an author to speak with us about their book and give us deeper insight into the public health issue that is the topic of the book. In the past, we've spoken to Jim Curran about AIDS, Ali Khan about the pandemic, about, uh, to Mona Hanna Tisha about water contamination. And if you'd like to see a list of all the books that we've read, you can scroll through the list at mbpg.org under Stay Certified and Book Club. And if you are certified in public health and you're interested in joining the book club, you can find instructions on joining on that page as well. So if you have questions today for our guests, please submit them through Zoom and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, in the next hour. We'll keep everyone on mute just to prevent any ambient noise from disrupting our conversation. So I'm very pleased to introduce Pam Fessler. So Pam was an editor and a correspondent at NPR News for more than 28 years. And as a correspondent on the national desk, she covered voting issues, poverty and philanthropy and much more. For, for much of her time at NPR, she reported on elections and voting, including an effort to make voting more accessible, accurate, and secure. And she did countless stories on everything from the debate over state voter laws to Russian hacking attempts and the impact of misinformation. She also covered homelessness, hunger, available uh, affordable housing, and uh, income equality. And she reported on efforts by non profit groups, the government, and others to reduce poverty and how those programs worked. So Pam has a master's degree in public administration from Syracuse University and a bachelor's degree from Rutgers University. So most germane to today is that she's just published her first book uh, that we're going to be discussing today, and it was published in late 2020. So Pam, I'm very happy that you were able to join us today. So um, we're gonna ask you a few questions um, submitted by the audience, but I'm assuming that there are a few folks on the call today that have not yet had a chance to read your book. Um, hopefully they'll go out and get a copy soon and read it after today's presentation. Um, but in the meantime, would you mind providing a brief overview of the book just to get us started? Certainly. Um, Allison, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I, I, this is very exciting for me because I love talking to public health professionals. And one of the main reasons is because I, have, I came to this book with no expertise in medicine, in science, in public health. Um, so I love to get the insights of people who actually know what they're talking about. Um, I came to this book uh, because of a personal story. And it began when my father-in-law called us one night in the middle of the week, it was 1998, and he was 78 years old at the time. And he said, I, I have something I have to tell you. I've been keeping a secret for more than 60 years. And when I was a teenage boy, I went to school and I came home and my father was gone and the public health service had come and taken him away. And he said, I never saw or spoke to my father again. And even at that time, even in 1998, he really didn't know what it had, where his father had gone. Uh, he did know that he had leprosy and he knew that he died three years later. Um, but he, he, he honestly had been keeping this secret um, for all these years, partly because his mother told him and his siblings, do not ever tell anybody that your father had leprosy because the stigma was so great and the embarrassment and shame for the family was so great. And he had kept it inside for more than 60 years. So we were sort of amazed and, and decided to try and figure out what in fact had happened to my father-in-law's father. And my sister-in-law did some investigating and we discovered that there was this institution 
in Carville, Louisiana, and it was a federal leprosarium. Um, the US government had ran it for um, about, well, they ran it about 80 years. It had existed even before that. And during much of the 20th century, many patients who were diagnosed with leprosy were taken from their homes and confined at Carville for the rest of their lives. Um, so we went down there with my father-in-law to visit. And in 1998, it was still, there were still patients there. Uh, mostly at that point, it was a um, more, more like a nursing home almost. And when I started investigating, we went down there and we saw this extraordinary place. It's on the grounds of an old plantation, um, beautiful 350 acre site, uh, but surrounded by a fence in a very remote area of Louisiana. Um, that's when I learned that my father-in-law's story was one of hundreds, if not thousands. And I decided right then and there to write this book about what we in fact had done as a, as a nation with people who had this disease. And then I found out that leprosy is one of the least contagious diseases there is. That 95% of the human race can't even contract the disease. And um, the other 5% is not actually easy to, to contract. And when I realized this and this, that these families had been ripped apart, I just realized what an extraordinary story was and also one that a lot of Americans uh, didn't know. So that's when, as I say, I decided to write the book. But the other thing I discovered in the course of doing the research of this book that was that Carvel became over the course of the 20th century, an extraordinary institution that for the patients who were confined there, uh, many they had been again ripped from their families, women who had children, their if they had got pregnant at a Carville, their babies were taken away from them and put up for adoption. They lost their identities. They were all, all asked, mostly asked to take aliases. Um, and, and it was all because of the stigma of this disease. At the stigma that that you know for centuries people believed that leprosy was highly contagious and just a just a very very um, terrible thing and that the best thing to do was to isolate people and keep them out of the public and um, as I was saying that that one of the extraordinary parts about over the course of the 20th century the patients began to band together and recognize the injustice that, um, that they were um, against them. And they started banding together. And I think it was, I think it's probably one of the first uh, patient advocacy movements in this country. And it was extraordinary and they fought for their rights and which they ultimately did get. Um, Carville also became a um, world renowned um, research facility over the course of this of the century. And in fact, that is where um, the uh, cure for leprosy was finally discovered. So there's a lot going on there. It's just an extraordinary story, both of very tragic um, uh, way we treat people with diseases, but also human resilience and hope. So there's so many, so many things to ask you, um, so many themes to this book. Um, so maybe we could just um, talk a little bit about the parallels to what happened with um, more recently, the stigma with AIDS. Um, so there, there are a lot of similarities to, um, to the, the reaction. So did you um, notice any similarities when you researched the book? Yeah, I mean, quite a bit. Um, so one, one of the things that, um, you know, um, part of the stigma of leprosy is, goes back to the Bible, where it was actually seen as a symbol of sin and sort of some, you know, moral um, um, transgression that the victims had made, had made. So it was seen that this disease was a reflection of God's punishment. Um, of, of these of these patients, and that's the stigma that many uh, leprosy, or and today we call it Hansen's disease, but many leprosy patients had to live under. Well, very similarly with um, AIDS, you know, first when it first came out, um, there, you know, obviously the medical community had no idea what was going on. Um, I, I spoke with 
um, some doctors who were right there in the hospitals when it first emerged in California. And one of the doctors told me, she said that some people said immediately, maybe we should just isolate these people on an island somewhere because we don't know what's going on. So there was that same sense that we have to just take this and, you know, isolate and get it, get, get, get these people away from um, the rest of society. And then obviously, initially, much of the reaction, both of the government and society in general, was that this was a disease that was a reflection of behavior that a lot of people didn't approve of because so many of the initial victims were gay men um, or drug um, abusers. And so I thought there was very much a parallel to, to, um, to leprosy uh, in, in that case. And it wasn't really until Ryan White, 13 year old boy who was a hemophiliac and um, contracted AIDS through a blood transfusion that people started to think, whoa, may, maybe, maybe we should deal with this in, in a different way. Um, so I think it's very much this idea that we sometimes demonize people um, uh, because of their disease, that we, we we sort of use disease as a weapon against people that for some other reason, maybe we, we, we don't want to associate with them. So in the book, um, there were references that we overreacted to um, enhances compared to how other countries te uh, treat it. And often it was it was just wasn't thought of um, in, in other countries. So did you have a chance to research why other countries reacted differently and how they manage it um, so differently than we did in the US? Yeah, I mean, quite frankly, for, for most of the world, people did respond to it very, very similarly to the way we did. I, I think what's more interesting is that there was a period of time uh, in the early 1800s well, oh, actually maybe 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, where people really didn't um, leprosy still continued, but you know, people just sort of dealt with it on a case by case basis. It was really around the time that um, germ theory emerged um, in the late 1800s that there was much more of a recognition that germs were causing diseases and people seemed to be coming a little bit more uh, frightened of the, the, the possibility that other people could give you these diseases. And in the United States, it all happened around the time of um, a great influx of immigration in the United States. And there were a lot of anti-immigrant sentiments at the time. And that was part of what happened in the late 1800s that, that led to the creation of what became Carville. It started out in Louisiana, excuse me, as the Louisiana leper home um, because it, it, there was a lot of um, a leprosy in the state of Louisiana. So they, they acted first and a lot of it was anti-immigrant behavior. There was this sense that all these immigrants were bringing in the disease and we need, if we isolate people, um, hopefully that will contain the spread of the disease. And very similar things were happening around the world. In many other, there was the, um, the, the uh, leprosy colony that was created in Molokai uh, on the island of Hawaii um, in the late, um, in the mid 1800s. There were uh, leprosy colonies, um, you know, in, in the Philippines and in other places. And a lot of it is a reflection also of what happened in medieval times in Europe when they had, you know, people who had leprosy were cast out of the community. They were not allowed to come into the community. They were isolated and they were treated in separate institutions. All with this belief, I mean, I think it's two things. It was a belief that that would contain spread of the disease, which is actually a myth, um, but also that these were bad people and we didn't want them anywhere near us. Well, there's also another, we were chatting earlier, another parallel that um, there was a struggle then, and I think there's a struggle now between the balance for individual freedom and sacrifice for the public good. So just kind of reflecting on where we are there and then and where we are now um, with COVID, what are your thoughts about that? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously the, the, the parallels are, are, are amazing. I think, I think what's different and, and kind of interesting to me is that leprosy was not a threat. You know, as I say, it was barely contagious. And, and quite frankly, it has a, such a long incubation period. My father-in-law's father, he actually, we believe he contracted it as a young soldier in the Philippines during the Spanish-American War in 1902. He did not exhibit um, any um, symptoms until 1922, that's 20 years later. Um, so that's how slow uh, developing it is. And as a result, if you isolate somebody who has it, if, if in any way they were gonna spread it to somebody else, they did that a long time ago. Um, that's why isolating people was just kind of a foolish um, policy. Um, but so, so anyway, here you had this disease that was not very, really as big a threat as people believed, but the response to it was draconian. I mean, you basically were imprisoning people for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Whereas now we have COVID, which is much more um, uh, a dangerous, um, but some of the responses that are kind of, you know, pretty benign, you know, would say wear a mask are, are being um, resisted. So, and, and the, also the difference is, at least in the early 20th century, there was no cure for, car, uh, for, for leprosy. So once you were brought there and confined there, you, you did stay for the rest of your life because there was no, we were talking about a lifetime confinement. Whereas with COVID, we're talking about measures that are temporary, you know? And, and so to me, that's the difference. So it's a very interesting thing, you know, how do you balance this? Um, you, you pick the right time to publish this book. Right. It makes you think. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, and I think, I think uh, hopefully the message to some extent, and that this is where I say I don't really have the expertise, is that, you know, it's really crucial, you know, these public health decisions have a lot of repercussions, you know, so in, in the case of, of leprosy, you know, have all these repercussions with the families for generations, not only for the individual patient, but, you know, my father-in-law, um, I hate to keep coming back to him, but it kind of ruined his life. You know, it, 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 you know, he was, he kept, by keeping this secret in all of his life, he just felt like a very, um, like almost like he was a failure. He lost his father when he was 15 years old and it, it, it scarred him. And since I wrote the book, I've heard from other families, members who had relatives back or grandparents or parents. And, and there's a lot that, you know, all these families kept this secret. And so, so yeah. it's made me realize just the, the power of what these public health decisions and the impact they can have, you know, and how, how, you know, meaningful it is. So I'm getting some great follow-up questions to what you're talking about. So I'm going to try to cover as many as I can, just so that folks can get um, response. So uh, just regarding your, um, your family history, <clears throat> they want to know if your husband's family found closure in the work, in your work? And did your husband's grandfather die at the colony? Is he buried there? Yeah, yeah, actually, so uh, he did die there. Um, he was brought there in 1935. Um, he, in fact, I, can I just tell a little quick story? So, Absolutely. He, so, so I told you he was diagnosed in 22. He was diagnosed in Connecticut. He was a butcher and he was diagnosed in Connecticut. And the way the law was written, it was up to the state public health service to decide if somebody diagnosed with leprosy would be brought to Carville. And um, every single state had that rule except New York because the doctors in New York said, you know what? This disease is not that contagious. We should not be confining people. So my um, father-in-law's uh, father's doctor said to him, I have to report you to the public health. And he said, the only thing you can do is if you go to New York, you will be able to um, um, not have to go uh, to Carville, but you're gonna have to basically hide from, from the authorities. So he left, packed up all of his belongings and left in the middle of the night. He left his family, his wife 
and three little children to go to New York where he set up a business and eventually they moved here. And he lived there for another um, 12 years or 13 years before he got actually so sick. Mm -hmm. And that's why the public health service finally in New York, they took him down to Carville because he had gotten so ill, but he basically had to hide uh, for 13 years. So anyway, when he got there, he was actually quite ill and he died within three years. So he died in 1938. Um, when we went down, my father-in-law didn't know where his father was buried. The public health service, a wonderful, wonderful public health service uh, worker at Carville actually researched and found that he was buried in a small Jewish cemetery in Baton Rouge. And so she took us there and we went to the cemetery and my father-in-law's father's tomb was way, way in the back corner, like just you know, it was almost as if he had intentionally been isolated because he had um, leprosy. It was way in the corner. And my mother-in-law and I noticed that all the other tombstones were covered with that dark, you know, like algae-like stuff. But this tombstone was clear and clean and bright white. And we realized that the public health service official had gone there ahead of time and cleaned it off. For us, which is, I, I, I just love that story. And so anyway, when we went, it was probably one of the most um, emotional moments of my life to walk my, with my father-in-law to the, into this cemetery. He was 78 years old to finally see, you know, where his father had been buried. And, um, you know, it was extraordinary that he had to wait so long. And you um, must've given so much closure to families that have these stories and just, can't, can't understand what it was like. And your book really brings that to light. And, and what's interesting is that there is a lot of the patients did manage to have fulfillment in their lives. They found a way many of them. And I, you know, I find it really interesting. Is that just sheer human resilience or I mean, what, what do you think pushed them on to find a way to survive there and have, have some fulfillment? Yeah. I mean, so that's the extraordinary thing to me about this book. I, I kind of feel like it's two pieces, right? You know, it's just this tragedy, this terrible thing that we as a government did to, to people who were sick. But on the other hand, the patients and what happened over, you know, the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s was extraordinary. Here they were, and usually at one time, there were about 5,000 patients over the course of Carville's uh, history. Uh, usually there were maybe three to 400 there at the time. And they were a cross section of America. You know, they were rich, they were poor, they were white, they were black, they were, um, you know, highly educated, they were illiterate, there were kids, there were old people. I mean, it really was a little world unto itself. And these patients, this became their world. And in a weird way, it was a prison, right? So they were confined there. They had to stay there. If they ran away and were brought back, they had to spend time at the Carville uh, jail. They had a little jail. I mean, it was really amazing. Um, but in another way, it was this haven because inside the grounds and the confines of Carville, they were not discriminated against. There was nobody who kind of pulled back and said, ooh, you have leprosy. Um, and, and, and most of the patients there, they maybe understood that it was not highly contagious. Nobody at the hospital who worked there over a course of a hundred years ever contracted the disease. So they all knew that they were being confined because of a myth. Um, so what they started doing, I mean, they, they just formed a whole society, uh, a community. You know, they, they started, um, they had dances, they had, um, they, they had clubs, they had sporting teams, especially after the federal government took over in 1921, there was a lot more money put into it. And the federal government realized that it was good to keep the patients active because, and give them a life, because if they didn't, they would like all run away. Um, um, and, and they had a newspaper, which became this major, mm -hmm. actually internationally known crusading newspaper. Uh, they had a, they, every year they had a Mardi Gras parade, which was a huge event with everybody getting all um, 
you know, dressed up in costumes, they had floats. Um, it was an extraordinary place. And I think that this having all these other activities and it, it gave the patients confidence to start fighting for themselves because they realized again how how unjust the um, the treatment their treatment was and especially after World War II you know because they the patients at Carville were just as patriotic as every other American and they did they had you know fundraising drives uh, to help the the war effort they had their own victory gardens. Um, if, if, in my book, what, even a couple of patients escaped and enlisted in the military so they could go fight in the war. But then when the war was over, it's like, we have just fought as a nation to free all these people around the world. Why am I still here? Why am I still confined behind these gates? And at the time, believe it or not, Allison, they, had, they did not have the right to vote because of a Louisiana law that people who were in institutions run by the state um, were not allowed to vote. And so you had people who had been brought from all around the country, including my father-in-law's father, who were veterans and they couldn't vote. Well, at the end of World War II, it was like, okay, we're gonna do something about this because this is just, and so the patients became real activists. It, it was, it's a, it's, I, uh, to me, is the favorite, my favorite part of the story. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, if you could change anything that happened in the book, one event, one decision, what would that be? Not in the book, in the history that you research. Right, 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 right. <laughs> right. Um, you know, honestly, I got to tell you, it would be just the creation of the place in the first place. You know, when the state of Louisiana recreated it at the end of the um, at the end of the 19th century, there there were there was a doctor. They they created what was called the lepers um, leper home board of control, and the doctor who was in charge of that, a doctor named Isidore Dyer, um, who, who became actually the dean of the um, Tulane uh, uh, Medical School uh, eventually. He, he, he wanted to start the, the home with a very um, altruistic reasons. And he thought that if the patients were brought together in some kind of an institution, um, that they could get good treatment, they would be protected from abuse from the public at large. And um, he wanted it located in New Orleans because it would be right and close to good medical um, facilities. Well, nobody in New Orleans wanted it near them. And that's why it ended up at, in this abandoned plantation 70 miles away on the river. Um, I, I think if it had been created at, in the city and that the patients had been able to have freedom to kind of come and go, then his dream would have been realized. And quite frankly, we probably would have come up with a, um, a cure faster. It was not until the 1940s that we did, that the public health service did come up with the cure at Carville. Um, but you know, when you put people far away and isolate them, they're out of sight, out of mind. Nobody was really thinking about it at all. And it wasn't until the patients started, you know, making a lot of noise um, that, you know, people started paying more attention. So I read somewhere that James Carvel is actually related to Carvel. Yeah. yeah <laughs> so yeah. is that true? Oh yeah, totally true. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so um, it, it, the reason then that the institution is called Carvel, it has many other official names, which I can't even remember what they all are, um, is because it's located in this tiny town that's called Carvel, Louisiana. And it was, and when I say town, we're, we're basically talking, it's not even an intersection. There's a road along the river. This, this is on the Mississippi River, a little, you know, basically dirt road along the Mississippi and another road that goes in and there's a few houses around and there was a general store and that also uh, doubled as the post office. And it was run by James Carville's um, grandfather. And the town used to be called Island 
uh, Louisiana, but there were other islands, uh, towns with the name of island in them in the state and the mail kept getting messed up. So they said, let's just call the town Carville. So that's how the town got named Carville. And as I say, this town, I mean, it, it's really, very few people at the time, as certainly at the time when when, um, when Carville was created, it was mostly farm area. And um, James Carville was born there, raised there, and he spent a lot of his time. I interviewed him for the book. He spent a lot of his time growing up, uh, going to the uh, leprosy hospital, and he did because by that time, this was in the you know fifties mostly. Yeah, it had become you know, the, the federal government, um, they, they started, uh, the, as I say, getting a cure. And it had a golf course. It had a swimming pool. And uh, Carville told me that if you wanted to go swimming anywhere between there and Baton Rouge in the summer, you got to know people who, uh, who, who were at the leprosy hospital. It also had this very high powered staff. You know, all these doctors came from around the world uh, because this became a premier research institution uh, for, um, for, for, for Hansen's disease. So Carville told me, he said, yeah, we used to like to brag. We had more PhDs per, um, per, per capita than they do at, in Rochester, Minnesota. Um, and he said, we were very proud of that. So he, he, he was there at a time when, you know, starting in the 50s and 60s, at one point, the federal government said, you do not have to stay here any longer. You can leave if you, initially, if you um, test negative for the, for the disease, and then eventually, even if you, if you didn't test the negative, um, because you could be treated on the outside. And so he was there at that time. You know, he was growing up. So he has a very different perspective about the institution than I do. He thinks it was fantastic, you know, that the pay, because he was there when the patients were active, when there were all these scientists, when people could come and go as they pleased. And he said, you know, he was very proud of it. And, and, and it employed a lot of the, almost all the residents of this little town who otherwise would have been very impoverished. He said it probably put everybody in the town through college and their children through college. And he said he would not have been who he, was, who he is today if it was not for that institute, federal institution being in this tiny remote area. Um, and of course, I come to, from, to the story from my father-in-law and all the damage that was done. So it's interesting how, and I think that's a reflection as we were talking about, you know, these two different sides of it. You know, that it was a prison, but it was also sort of this haven and a miraculous place. So there's a question about where we are now with, well, actually, I want to ask you one question. Is it okay to call it leprosy or should it be called Hansen's? Because I'm um, switching back and forth and I don't know if that's appropriate. So um, a lot, the, so one of the things that the patients did was try and get people to not use the word leprosy because it was so stigmatized because of the the the, um, um, the Bible, and they had this campaign that actually became a, a national and international campaign uh, not to use the word leprosy but to call it Hansen's disease. And Hansen is the doctor in Norway who, in the 1800s, discovered the germ that, that uh, caused the disease, and um, so, so they they were trying to get people not to use leprosy because they didn't want these this this stigma, you know, that, that the word carried to carry to them, right? Um, but more importantly, they did not want people to use the word leper. Mm -hmm. because that really, I mean, we you look the word up uh, at leper in the dictionary today, it means outcast, a pariah, and so they really did not want the word leper used. I in my book have used leprosy partly because that is the way most people understand the disease. And 
I, I was very struck. I went to Norway. Um, we were just on vacation, but I did go to Dr. Hansen's. Um, there, there, there was a leprosy hospital in um, in Bergen, Norway, where he did all of his research and where he made the discovery. And I noticed there that they actually call it leprosy. They don't call it Hansen's disease. This is in Norway. <laughs> and so that kind of made me realize, I, I, I feel like leprosy is okay to use, but I do not use the word okay. leprosy, except in the book with, um, you know, when I had to, like the name, it was called the Louisiana leper home back in, um, you know, in the, in the early 1900s. So, so that's, a, and I, I really, I really don't use that word. Well, the person's not the disease. We don't do that exactly. with other diseases. So that makes sense. Exactly. Right. And, and you know, leper is just so, uh, yeah. you know, derogatory. Right. Um, so the, the question is, so where are we now? Are there cases in the United States? And what, what is the prognosis if you have been diagnosed? So um, there are about 200 new cases diagnosed every year in the United States. So it's pretty rare. Um, around the world, though, there are about 200,000 new cases every year diagnosed. It's mostly in India, um, Brazil are the, are the two main ones. Um, we now have, um, it, it's a, sort of a multi-drug therapy, uh, antibiotics um, um, that people can take if they're diagnosed with the disease. And within, I've been told within 48 to 72 hours, you are no longer contagious. And that within a year, the germ is completely eradicated from your body. Um, so it is quite frankly, if it's diagnosed early, can be um, cured very, quite, very easily. And the World Health Organization and Novartis have pledged, I think years ago, to make this drug available free to anybody who needs it. So it can be easily cured, the drug is free, but people still, not only do people still get diagnosed, but many, many people get diagnosed way too late. Um, and when, when I say way too late, that's because um, the damage is, you know, it, over, over years, it can cause damage to your nerves. And that's when you see the people, people who have, you know, their, their extremities are damaged. Um, or, or paralyzed, or people go blind. My, my father-in-law's father went blind because of what it does to the nerves around the eyes. And a lot of the reason that people don't come to get diagnosed is because of the stigma, because it still exists. And um, well, there's two things going on. One is, it's actually a difficult disease to diagnose. So there really is no test easy tests. So sometimes people go to the doctors for maybe some little blemish or some little numbness, which can often be an initial some, a symptom, and it's misdiagnosed for, for quite a while. So that's a problem. Um, but then, but the, but the big problem, I think, is the stigma. And I was shocked. Um, in the United States now, people who are diagnosed can be treated, they're usually treated at clinics around the country. Uh, the National Hansen's Disease Program, which is run by um, uh, HHS um, has clinics around the country. They also have a main facility in Baton Rouge. And often when somebody is diagnosed, they will come to the Baton Rouge hospital maybe for a month or so just to get, make sure that they're, you know, getting the proper treatment and know exactly what to do. Um, so one of the, I, 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 I found out that of the new patients, this was like a year or two ago, who come there, they did a survey of them and asked you know, what their first response was when they were diagnosed with leprosy. And this is even today, 50% of those patients said they wanted to um, take their own lives. And it was because they were so worried about how they would be treated when they went home. You know, that if people found out they had this disease, that they would lose their job or they would be scorned, it, almost like medieval times. Oh, that just gave me chills. That's amazing. Hmm. And, um, and it, it, it's pretty common response. I mean, it, it, that, that's what happened. You know, so many of the stories yeah. that I wrote about people at Carville over the course of the years, uh, time, 
their first reaction was to kill themselves. It, it, and indeed, that was what my father-in-law's father um, initially was going to do before he fled Connecticut uh, to New York. Uh, he said that he wanted to kill himself. So, thank God he didn't. Yeah. Um, so here's a interesting question. They, um, you mentioned about that everybody, it didn't matter who you are, you were sent to Carvel, the rich and the poor. So it says the book describes a community that was truly integrated during a time that the rest of the world and the US was not. So how was that integration perceived by the outside community? Um, you know, it, it's, in, it's very interesting. I mean, that was one of the great, so they actually had, we, here we are in the Jim Crow South, right? And in the thirties and forties and the Carville um, patients had an integrated baseball team. They had a school for the children. It was integrated. And of course, this wasn't, ha not only was it not happening in, in, the, in the South, it was certainly not happening in many places in, in the United States. Um, I did not come across any sort of negative reaction from the outside to this integration. I think because, excuse me, because the patients were already isolated and they were being discriminated against because they had leprosy, uh, not because of the color of their skin. Um, what was interesting to me was that th there was a great story about a young man who's black, who was a patient there, and he had gone there as a young child. And when he was around 18, 19 or 20, um, he was able to leave because he was you know, finally responding to the medical treatment and he was cured and he went out and he was shocked by how he was treated because he was black outside the hospital. He could not believe it. And he came back <laughs> because he said, things are so much better here. Um, but, but, you know, I think it, it's interesting initially when they, when the Louisiana leper home was first built there in the, in the late 1800s, the, the surrounding community was furious. They did not want leprosy mm -hmm. patients anywhere, but eventually, and I think part of it was because people started getting jobs there, you know, and, and, and making money from the place, this whole surrounding area embraced the Carville community. So as I say, like with Jim, James Carville, there was a lot of pride in it. And they, at one point, I, I told you they had these uh, baseball teams, they joined what was called the River League. So they played, local teams would come from outside and they would play um, games with the Carville team. And the Carville team not only won the tournament like the first year, but their star pitcher was black. And it was, I think this was in uh, probably the late forties. And it was in all the newspapers, you know, that he was just this incredible um, athlete and, you know, a hero basically. And I strongly believe that the fact that, that, that Carville was this incredibly integrated, diverse community is what gave those patients confidence and strength to go out and fight eventually for their rights. That's amazing. Um, so the oh, next- Can I say one, one, one quick Yes, thing? absolutely. It wasn't like it was totally integrated there. I mean, mm. there was still, the patients had dorms um, and they still did, you know, the black patients lived in their own dorms and the white patients. And a lot of it was self-selected, but there was, I shouldn't, you know, it's not a hundred percent, but mostly right. uh, it, it was. Well, I, I did find it interesting that they did not want the women, men and the women to picnic together. And I, I would love to know what the harm was, why, what they were trying to prevent. Yeah, you know, initially, we haven't really talked about this, but when, when it was first started by the uh, Louisiana, um, they couldn't get anybody to go out there and take care of the patients. So the state of Louisiana recruited the Daughters of Charity sisters mm -hmm. uh, to go out there and be the nurses. So they went out, they actually were not thrilled about doing it initially, but they went out and, and basically staffed the hospital. Um, you know, they were pretty much deserted, the, you know, the patients and, and the nurses. And actually through the course of history, the Daughters of Charity um, 
remained the nurses, not only the nurses at Carville, but also there were, the chief pharmacist was a, a, a daughter of charity. The, the physical therapists were daughters of charity, um, partly because when the federal government came in, the US Public Health Service took over in 1921, they couldn't get other people, they couldn't get public health nurses to come there. So they decided to keep these sisters on as federal employees. Um, and they were there until 2005, believe it or not. Um, but anyway, I think that part of that initial keeping the men and the women apart, there was two things. One was, I think it was this, you know, conservative Catholicism. You know, we don't want the men and the women mingling. Um, but they did not, they were not allowed to get married. Um, at all at Carville, there was a, a, a belief in that there is something to this that children were more susceptible to getting um, uh, Hansen's disease than older people. So there, there was a concern about obviously people having babies uh, inside. And um, there was a belief, some people believe that, oh, it might be genetic, it might be passed on, mm -hmm. uh, which is not true. Um, but there was a belief that, so that the, the best thing to do was to keep the men and women separate. And again, they were not supposed to get married. However, you have all these people stuck together <laughs> in this world, this 350 acre uh, plantation, young men, young women, and of course they fell in love. And I think there was actually a lot of sex going on there. Um, <laughs> and then numbers of them decided couples would actually escape from Carville. There was a, what was called a hole in the fence that the patients would sneak under. They would go to Baton Rouge or New Orleans and they would get married. And then they would actually come back to Carville because as I say, it was more of a haven for a lot of them. And then the federal government had to figure out what to do with them. Now, initially they kept them apart, but then, you know, as I say, the public health service <laughs> recognize that they, they had to treat, at least the doctors who were there, that they had to give these people, this was their life, right? The patient's life. They had to give them some semblance of a normal life. So some of the patients started building little sheds out in the back of the grounds behind the dorms that they just got used material from and they built, and they actually started becoming little houses. And the federal government let them have these little houses and they let married couples go and live in those houses. Um, they used to call it Cottage Grove. And, um, you know, it was part of this mm -hmm. weird dichotomy of things going on, you know, that, that they shouldn't get married, but well, if they do, you know, they should at least have a little cottage with a garden in front and, you know, were allowed to keep pets if they lived in these little cottages. So there's another question that's right up your alley as a correspondent um, about the power of media. And I, I think this is coming from the misinformation, the COVID pandemic, but you know, the, the, as you mentioned, the newspaper played a really prominent role in changing how the patients were treated. And it was a remarkable story that this newspaper in those days became so well known. Right. So I think just some general commentary about the power of information and misinformation would be great. Well, well, I think there were two things, right? So, so I was so struck as a reporter about the reporting in the late 1800s about this disease and spreading all, there, there were actually quite a few doctors at the time who did not think it was that contagious. But the mm -hmm. media, the local, the media, especially in New Orleans, they started drumming up this, you know, this is terrible. We have people with leprosy here, mm -hmm. you know, um, they, they, they're handling your meat in the meat market, you know, they're walking in your neighborhood. And it, it really was a lot of the media and then some doctors who also, and, and some of these anti-immigrant groups that were really drumming up this fear in the late 18th. And it is in fact what led to the creation of the Louisiana leper home. And then eventually, same thing with um, the, the, when the federal government took over, there were all these stories and I, I, I can't even get into the story about John Early, but you have to read the book for that. that. That was like an amazing story about this man who was just hounded, but it was, you know, the media to such an extent um, really just fanned the fires of, of, of a lot of the mythology um, and, and fear about this disease. 
And so these doctors, the, the people in the medical community who recognized that it was not that contagious, they were they had to kind of fight against that and they really couldn't. You know, the public was so, the politicians, everybody's like, oh, we got to do something about it. Let's get rid of these people. Um, but then what you're referring to is in the, within Carville, the patients um, started this newspaper. It was started by a patient named Stanley Stein, who was really brilliant. And he decided he was not going to become what he said, one of the living dead. And he asked the powers that be, can we start a patient newspaper? And they said, oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. And at first it was pretty benign, but then it started getting edgier and edgier. And they started writing articles questioning their treatment and the patients questioning why in fact they were confined. And the paper started getting distribution, not only within Carville, but outside Carville. Um, the American Legion, actually adopted Carville patients because there were quite a few veterans there as kind of a cause. So the American Legion actually distributed the newspaper and, and sold the newspaper around the country and then started getting international recognition. And this newspaper, they, they really asked the questions. They reported on research going on around the world. And it was the driving force behind this effort to kind of shift the narrative about whether or not these patients um, were being treated fairly or appropriately. And, and that's in fact what, what, what happened. I mean, I, that, that eventually the government felt so much pressure. It's like, okay, we need to have these patients. They can leave if they want. Um, and to me, it's kind of interesting because I think one of the questions and some of the patients raised this, why is it up to us? to try and convince the American people that we are not a threat. Why isn't it the public health service that is doing that? If, you know, why shouldn't, why is, you know, their response was to confine us. And of course, by confining us, you're only reaffirming this belief that they are a threat. And, you know, so there is, I think this question there, whose responsibility is it to get out the correct information, even if it means going against what is, you know, sort of public, political, you know, belief. Yep, a lot of parallels to what's yep. what's going on right now. <laughs> right, you know, you, there's so much pressure I know on these public officials. Yeah, you know, oh no, you can't say that because yeah. you know, people will freak out. But well, then you think somebody's going to write a book about this in a hundred years, and what are they going to say about it? So right. I think that's that's a perspective you have to take. Um, I've got a number of questions for you about the process of writing a book. Seems like folks would like to, most of us, I'm going to say, have not written a book. So what's the process? How much research? How many drafts? What's it like? Um, I, I it was great. I mean, it was fun. <laughs> as, as a reporter who's spent, you know, I was a reporter for 47 years and I was always going from what topic to topic to topic. And it was so great to just, dive into one thing. And I did take a leave of absence from NPR for a year, uh, 2018, to do most of my research. I was so blessed and so lucky to have an abundance of information. Um, down at Carville, there actually is now, um, it, it, the, the institution still is there. It is actually a Louisiana um, uh, National Guard facility, but there is a museum that um, is still there, the National Hansen's Disease Museum. And the curator has kept all these records. I mean, she has wonderful, wonderful, wonderful records um, of what the patient's lives were like. The newspaper had incredible detail about what the patients did day in and day out. The Daughters of Charity were meticulous note keepers and they have their archives not far from me in Emmitsburg, uh, Maryland. So I could go up there and go through all their records. They kept diaries of every day. This happened, this ha you know, might've only been two sentences. So it was incredible. And a, a number of the patients, this Stanley Stein, who was the editor of the newspaper, uh, wrote a book, a couple other ones wrote memoirs. Um, so I really had tons of information. Plus there were still patients alive 
uh, when um, I was writing the book. So I was able to interview people who had spent some, in some cases, decades uh, living at Carville. So it was wonderful. And I was able to, um, I don't know, just pull it together. The hard, the biggest challenge for me as a reporter was not to make it sound like a, a newspaper story, but to make it sound like a book, almost a novel, you know, it, it, that, you know, that this was a story of people. So I really, really tried to focus on the people. You know, because that's how I entered it was had the impact on, on an individual human's life. So I really tried to tell a story through the mm -hmm. eyes of, of the patients. And that's really how you can get, you know, messaging across a, about complex issues is bring it back to the people that it impacts. So and I, and I should do that really well. Oh, thank you. And I should tell you, I mean, I honestly... I barely knew the difference between a virus and a bacterium. You know, I just, I, I really had very little um, background in, in science medicine. And I thought I wasn't gonna be able, I thought, oh, I'm not even really gonna deal with that, but I had to. Um, and, and so that was great. I mean, I just, I feel like I learned a lot. Um, I'm sure you guys will find some kind of errors uh, in my medical descriptions, but um, you know, so so that that was a big, that was probably the most challenging thing for me personally. Yeah, and two people have asked: Are you going to be writing another book? Anything in your horizon? Um, I don't have any plans right now. Um, I I tell people often that you know a book is so hard to write, and it is you have to really, really feel passionate about it. I, I felt very passionate about this. I promised my father-in-law before he died that I would write this book. And it, it just meant so much to me. And I, I don't have anything else on the horizon, but I mean, who knows? Who knows, you know? Yes, that's right. <laughs> um, and I've, there's uh, one person just asked, I think two people asked if you are available to speak at schools of public health. I am so available. <laughs> I, um, I just retired from NPR uh, three weeks ago. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So I am you know, trying to figure out how to maneuver that. Um, I, I have a combination of trying to relax and, and do fun things. But I also, as I say, I feel so strongly about this story. I mean, I just feel like it's an important story to at least talk about, if nothing else. Right. So yes. <laughs> okay, and if folks want to find you, how can we facilitate that for anybody that's on the call today, or how can we do it, help you? Yeah. Um, if you you my email, uh, there's two ways. Uh, the best way probably is, is info at pamfessler.com, and that's p-a-m-f as in Frank e-s-s-l-e-r.com. Um, and also, I'll, I'll give you guys my personal one too. It's just Pam Fessler four. Um, uh, number four um, at gmail.com. Okay. So that's, Great. Yeah, this is a, such a compelling story. I think public health students everywhere would, would love to hear your story. And I'd love to hear um, response, a reaction to it, because I'm, I'm curious from, you know, your guys' perspective, you know, you, you're, you're out in the field, you know what, 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 what impact these decisions make. I'm just interested what kind of parallels you see as well. Right. Okay, well, unfortunately, we're at the top of the hour, but this was, you were wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, just, and anybody who hasn't read the book, please, please go out and get it because it's just a wonderful read. So many good messages. And um, as we talked about today, so many parallels to what's happening right now. So it's just really good, uh, fulfilling book to read. All right. Well, thank you, Pam. Thank Appreciate you, it. It was great. Right. Take care. Bye-bye.